Welcome to today's webinar. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is brought to you thanks to the contributions of colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is produced in collaboration with Healthy Places by Design, an organization that advances community-led action and proven strategies to ensure health and well-being for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. This webinar will be recorded. All speakers' views are their own. Guest bios and slides from today's webinar are available on our resource page. We will share a link to the resource page when the webinar begins. Stay up to date on all things CHRNR. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter by scanning this QR code with your phone's camera. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars, our podcast, and our latest tools and resources. Your facilitators today include our host, Erica Burroughs Girardi, with support from CHRNR communication specialist, Colleen Wick, and the collaborative learning director from Healthy Places by Design, Joanne Lee. We invite you to continue the conversation immediately after the webinar in our discussion group. Joanne Lee will be our lead facilitator. And watch for a chat from Colleen for details on how to join the group after the webinar. Hi, and welcome to Racial Healing for Health, our first webinar of the 2023 season. My name is Erica Burrows Girardi. This year, you can expect our webinars to continue to inform you, but also challenge you to think differently and work differently, all in the service of advancing equity in your community. And this webinar will be no different. Today marks the seventh observance of the National Day of Racial Healing. The Kellogg Foundation created this event to make space for communities to contemplate our shared values and create the blueprint together for how we're gonna heal from racism. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps subscribes to the narrative that we work together to repair and heal from the past and current harms of systems of oppression. Racial healing is important to us. Why? Well, because you cannot advance equity without addressing racial equity. The two are just inextricably linked. So like the Kellogg Foundation and other organizations committed to equity, County Health Rankings and Roadmap supports the need for racial healing. So I thank you for joining us on this very important day. Today's webinar will be powerful as we learn from two racial equity champions. Let's prepare ourselves to be in this learning space. I wanna introduce you to others who are going to join us. And I'm gonna start with the birthday girl, Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design. Hi Joanne and happy birthday. Thank you, Erica, you outed me. It feels good to be 45 again. Um, it's so great to be here. A thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us. Um, my role today during the live webinar will be monitor the Q&A box. So folks, go ahead and open the Q&A box and make sure that you use that space specifically to type in any questions as they come to mind and you listen to our wonderful presenters today. So you don't have to hold off on typing in your question. I'll be keeping track of what comes in. And later on during the webinar, we will be able to address as many questions as possible during this live session. If we're not able to get to your question, during the live session, I encourage you to join me and Erica in the post webinar discussion group, you will be getting more information about that at the end of the webinar. But right now I want to introduce you to Colleen Wick and she is going to be engaging with you all in the chat. Colleen. Thanks, Joanne. And I see a lot of people wishing you happy birthday in the chat. Um, so as Joanne said, I will meet you in the chat. Use the chat to share remarks or respond to questions that we may ask you during the webinar. 
Our chat conversations tend to be very engaging, as you could probably see. So if they are too distracting, simply just close the chat window. If you have any questions for the panelists, use the Q&A box, just as Joanne described. Um, and now I would like to introduce you to our technologist, James Lloyd. Thank you, Colleen, and I'm going to wish uh, Joanna happy birthday, too. Uh, I'm here to help support technology, and so uh, I'll keep an eye on both the chat and the Q&A pod. And if you have any technology questions, those will be directed to me, and we'll do what we can to make sure you have the best experience possible. Uh, this is a great topic today. I'm looking forward to it, Erica. Yeah, I agree, James. So um, thank you so much to all of the members of the production team that, that make this learning space so special. You know, there are multiple pathways to racial healing. Listed here are selected strategies to advance healing through policy and relationship building. Last year's webinar, and when we did one on racial healing, was focused on that third bullet. And I encourage you to check, to check out last year's webinar if you haven't already. And it tells the story of the city of Charleston's racial healing journey that began with the 2015 mass shooting at a beloved church there to its current racial equity commission. So we have made that link available to you in the resource guide that you're gonna to receive tomorrow. And, and again, if you haven't seen that webinar, you want to see that webinar as well. Now today's webinar, um, we're gonna, focus on those first bullets, those two bullets you see here. And we're gonna talk about what that looks like in action, particularly practices for understanding historical harms and repairing relationships, as well as training for overcoming bias and healing. So please uh, join me in welcoming our two guests. Dr. Nia Ayatoto is a researcher exposing inequities in Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander health, as well as solutions to redress those inequities. And if Dr. Ayatoto looks familiar, it's because she joined us in 2021 for another webinar. And I wanna welcome her back. Welcome back, Dr. Ayatoto. And you said I could call you Nia. So welcome back. Thank you, great to be back. And let me, let me tell you folks, Nia is such a busy person and I, I have a really a special thanks to her because she's actually supposed to be in the Philippines today, but she postponed her trip so she can join us um, for this webinar and she's flying out tomorrow. So I, I especially thank you so much for being with us. We also have a link to the webinar that Nia participated in um, last year and that's also gonna be in your resource guide. And I also want you to join me in welcoming Tony Watkins. Now, Mr. Watkins has described himself as a white male once complicit in racism. He is now an anti-racist community organizer committed to ensuring that all residents in Albuquerque, New Mexico, experience a fair and just opportunity to succeed. Hi, Tony, and welcome to the webinar. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me. Um, I also want to thank, you know, Sherry Johnson and Diane Applebaum and Francisco Ronquillo for connecting me with you um, and all this. So just, it's a blessing to be here. Thanks for having me. You are absolutely welcome. And I encourage you all to read about more about our guests by visiting the resource page. Colleen, if you'll just check that out one more time, that'd be awesome. And you can uh, take a look at their bios. They're very impressive, so trust me. Now, don't forget, our post-webinar discussion group is the place where you can really unpack what you're going to hear today. So please plan to continue the discussion with us um, during the video intro. You heard about these discussion groups. Joanne also mentioned it when she was doing her introduction. Some of you have been to these discussion groups. You know how incredible um, um, interactive they are. So Joanne facilitates those. They're always engaging and it gives you the opportunity to share, but also learn from others. So Take the time to join us if you have uh, the time to join us afterward. And Colleen's going to chat out a link to the discussion group toward the end of the webinar. Today, we're going to explore these questions with our guest. What is settler colonialism and what has its impact been on populations who've experienced it? What are solutions to historical trauma and how can racial healing lead to meaningful policy change? So I kind of want you to keep those questions in the back of your mind 
as you listen to what our guests have to say to that today. And with that, I, I wanna offer a, a brief definition of settler colonialism, just so we're all on the same page. And then I'm gonna bring Nia back to the mic, but settler colonialism is defined as a, a type of colonialism in which indigenous people living in a region are displaced by settlers who moved there permanently and create a new society. And all of us in this space, that probably sounds familiar to you because the United States was formed using that strategy. So settler colonialism is, is, um, is a familiar thing that happened in our uh, country's history. So with that, um, Nia, I, I wanna bring you back to the mic because I wanna talk about what happened to the populations in Hawaii and the Pacific Islanders as a result of, of settler you know, co colonialism, because life changed for them. You know, how did settler colonialism create trauma for the indigenous populations living there? A great question. Um, to put things in context, the U.S. colonization of Hawaii and what is now known as the U.S. Pacific jurisdictions, which are territories and compact of free association nations, began in the late 1800s and early 1900s for Hawaii, Guahan or Guam, and America Samoa, and mid-1940s for the Commonwealth of the North Mariana Islands and the compact of free association nations like the Republic of Palau, Republic of the Marshall Islands and the Federated State of Micronesia. So I, many Americans don't even know that we do have these Kofa nations and territories and, and all of that, but we do, right? Um, and um, when it comes to historical trauma, um, it's, um, it started with war and heavy militarization and military presence in the region. And that in of itself is very traumatic. Um, but it's very important to note that um, historical trauma um, you know, and all that is very complicated and has numerous dimensions, but also have layers. So hopefully in our conversation, we'll co cover some of the dimensions and in layers. And, and trauma is also experienced on the individual level and then also on the collective societal um, level, right? So in, in many situations, you know, group of people experience one thing at a certain time, different periods of time, but we are going through the pandemic all at the same time, right? I think our understanding of a collective experience, you know, it's it's yeah. it, it's a good example. It's COVID nineteen. We all experience it, right? But in different ways, right? So keep that in mind. But there's also a lot of like spiritual, psychological, physical, environmental trauma, and all of those stuff they all intersect, right? So and I think that's the complexity of it all. And trauma yeah. span through generations and also evolve along the way, right? Um, yeah. So I keep on hearing things like, well, you know, that happened so long ago. But actually, you know, uh, militarization of the region is still going on right now. But we are also product of what happened, right? So if you look at this map, right, in, you know, my example, and there's so many um, impacts of historical trauma in our, in our region and for Pacific Islander, but I'm focusing on militarization because it gives such a good example of what, you know, what's going on and what happened. So if you look at it, so um, one of the um, results of that is the, you know, the, the mining and the misuse of our natural resources, right? And also forced militarization, right? So the US Navy, um, you know, so for most of, so let's take the US Compact of Free Association. The Navy, you know, was after World War II, during World War II period, Navy were there in 1940s. It became part of Department of Interior. And in the 1986, you know, to 94, like they became, they have a, a formal relationship with the United States, right? So. With all of that going on at a political level, but there's also things that happen on island or with our land and sea. So between 1946 and 1958, the U.S. detonated 67 nuclear bombs on in and above the Marshall Islands, right, wow. exiling hundreds of people from their homeland. But when if you understand that, it's not just the Marshall Islands, right? It's also the ocean, right? And also islands around it and, and all that. So the entire region, that whole part right there, right? It really did, it affected us in that way. But also even up to now, there's like military bases, right? Still in the Pacific, right? Um, Lusaka, you know, the garrisons in Kwajalein Act, 
battle in the Marshall Islands, military base in Guam, of course, Hawaii, and all of that. So a lot of that, the presence of the military there, mm -hmm. um, you know, has an effect. But I also want to let people know it's a complex issue, you know, because I think when we talk about this, there's always people that were saying, like, you know, Pacific Islander are anti-military, you know, military is important. Yes, military is important, but we're not anti-military. Because if you look at the statistics, you know, from mm -hmm. the Federation of Micronesia, they volunteered to serve in the U.S. Armed, for, armed Forces approximately double the per capita rates of Americans, right? And within the U.S. per capita, there are more Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders in the military than any other ethnic group, right? So that, that whole narrative, understanding the complexity of things like this, right? And then also, you know, all of that when it comes to healing, right? Because it does hurt, right? Thinking that we're anti-Americans, anti-military and all of that, yeah. and all of those statistics, right? Um, you know, so, but at the same time, we are serving in the military, but then also it's still ongoing, you know, with the, and especially with natural resources, you know, it's not yeah. only they're using it for military bases, but they also, I think, um, you know, like one of the most recent one is in the state of Hawaii, right? In Red Hill with water, right? So access to clean water because yeah. they were using it for storage of gas and all of that kind of thing. So so if you look at it, you know, as Pacific culture, you know, like natural resources is very important to us. We know yeah. its limitation, we know its value and it's used for us. So I feel like that is a really good example of, you know, not only colonization, but the continuous, you know, what being colonized nice but then also see it all around us right yeah. so i feel like that that does something to us so um and and, and here you have um the uh, some statistics about how diabetes is impacting people who live in that region um how has that historical trauma translated into health uh, health outcomes so that way we see diabetes being one of those diseases in which people in the region are just grappling with Yes. So diabetes, you know, I, I use diabetes as an example because that's my body of work. You know, that's that's my lane. You know, I do a lot of diabetes work. But if you look at it, look at this data, you know, um, you know, our rates in the region, you know, it's like 47 percent, you know, in American Samoa to 11 percent in Guahan, which is much higher than 8 percent. But if you really look into it, these are very dated data. There's very limited data, you know, in the Pacific. So even on the data part of it and not a lot of thoughts, resources or priority is given to Pacific Island data, right? We don't count. So, you know, like they recognize the, our small numbers, right? Your number's too small. We cannot, you know, do anything to your numbers and all that, right? So there's continuous, you know, discussions, you know, around lack of data for Pacific Islander, because as we all know, in order for us to access, you know, any, you know, I'm a grant writer, you know, I write grants, right? It's very hard to justify when we have no data, right? There's a saying, right? You know, in God we trust in the U.S. Um, you know, but everybody else bring data when <laughs> we don't have data, right? So if you look at it, so data is, is part of the issue, but also there's a deeper reason why, you know, diabetes is an is a issue. So um, next slide. Um, and I just want to, you know, given all of those high rates of diabetes in the region, I also want to remind people that was not always the case. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like back in the early, you know, 1800s, this is what the first Europeans saw, right? They were, you know, drawing pictures of us who were very healthy and all of, you know, and, and all of that, right? But it's very, um, you know, very, very different today. And a lot of the, you know, there's so many reasons why, right? Because, you know, um, of course, you know, when we we have the, the the atomic bomb and all those bombs, right? We cannot eat, you know, anything that came out of the water. We rely on fish and all the seafood. We cannot eat anything that's in the ground. So growing all of those kind of things at that point in time. And we're talking like generations, right? You know, it yeah. takes um, a long time for the, the ocean to heal, right? You know, for plants to come up and all that. And that knowledge of planting and cooking and utilizing those natural resources, it can lose within those generations not being passed down, right? So it's very important for us to remember about historical trauma and how information, how culture had all of those traditions can, um, you know, can be passed on to. Especially to when, I was just going to say, especially when there's a, a big interruption like that, you have this interruption with the colonialism that happened that just 
really broke the, the, the tie of the generations of passing knowledge on down the generation to generation. Yes, but yeah, you said it perfectly, you know, it's something happened and, and it broke. So I, I, I feel like I think understanding that can understand people's, you know what I mean? vision of who we are as Pacifica people, right? Yeah. Because I think a lot of people still don't know who we are, you know, um, here in the here in the US. So next slide. Oh, and then in this slide, it also talk about, I think, looking at health, right? So when the US came in and in any colonized, it doesn't have to be the US because, you know, indigenous people are being colonized everywhere on earth, right? And then one of the pattern of colonization is that when they come in, one of the first thing that they want to control actually is your thinking, right? You know what I mean? About, you know, this whole reorganization. So in the, and the US was actually one of the late, the latest group that colonized us because in the early 1900s, we had the Germans and then the Japanese and then, you know, and then, then finally, the the U.S. So in those era through colonization and onto the U.S., what they actually did also is reorganizing healthcare system, right? Um, my computer is up again. So in reorganizing healthcare system, what what happened was that say so they come in and say, well, we'll build hospitals. So when you get sick, don't do any of your traditional healing, traditional culture and traditions or whatever else, right? You just take yourself to we'll be responsible for your healing, right? And all of that. So a lot of that, like a lot of that literature around reorganizing hospital, the way that we seek healing and all that happened that way. But we have a very rich tradition, traditions and traditional healing and all of those kind of things. But somebody from public, we just had this Talanoid this discussion with um, diabetes um, management um, in our diabetes management class, what actually happened is change your mentality saying that when you get sick, you go to the hospital, they'll give you pills and they will take care of it. You're not responsible for your health anymore, right? But that's the opposite of what we're trying to teach our patient. Like you are responsible for your health, right? Eating right and exercise, right? So they're removing that power to take care of ourselves, And it's very hard to get that back. It's very subtle, but it's very hard to get back. So somebody that does di you know, pre-diabetes research and education and programs and all that and diabetes, that is very hard to change, right? Changing our mindsets, right? In those, yeah. in those kind of things. It's like, it's like double messages. <laughs> I, I yes. see what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> what happened, yes. what, what happened in the mid 1900s and how has that um, affected what's happening in our region now, in that region of the country now? Yes. So if you look at our rates of diet, people are just, when you look at the rates, like 47%, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They just, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't believe it. But, you know, but if you look at what happened was that with the, the we call it the American era, right? So bomb the lands or whatever else. So we couldn't eat any of our fish or, you know, fruits and vegetables and all of those kind of things. So it's an introduction of canned food. So it's this, we see this big boat coming in, you know, with rations, like those military rations and kind of thing. And then that's it, like high salt, you know, sugar, you know, preservative and all that. And you're talking about a group of people that were never exposed to that before then, right? So as you mentioned earlier, that subtleness, right? Like all of a sudden, you know, this, uh, so it's not even like a gradual introduction, right? So it was this subtle, this happened, and then therefore all of this thing. Um, and then that's it, you know, our taste buds is different we know mm -hmm. like you know he used to saw and then we have to consider all of that too right the complexity of you know all of all of this kind of change and even that other picture right so I always look at that picture I used in my session right of that military police with the gun you know protecting mm. all of the salt food and I was telling you know a lot of our participants I wish that was at the you know grocery store you know where that ice cream and whatever protecting you you from it right it's all of that the mint the way food I think the way that we think about food food it's come from a can versus come from the land right especially people were and all of those kind of thing and you know this slide here then I always want to loop back and I think it's part of my culture to always put things in context right you know that was not you know all of this health stuff like that was not always the case before the in the beginning of the U.S. um occupation or in U.S. presence in the region, there was a survey conducted by the U.S. Navy in the 1940s because they were administering the islands. They found, you know, intestinal parasites and yaws, which is a skin condition, TB and skin disease, complete absence of, of malnutrition 
or obesity, right? No indication of diabetes and no hypertension. So we're talking about a group of people that went from, you know, high rates of diabetes and everything to now, right? So it really is, um, it really is a dramatic shift and change. Yeah, because that's just from the 1940s. So it's uh -huh. not even, um, you know, oh my gosh. Yeah, we did so a generation, all... there's still people, yeah. There's yeah. still yeah, one generation, yeah. It's a, you have to yeah. So let's talk about, you know, let's transition and talk about what do we do now? Like, how do we heal from all of this and, you know, make life better? What do we do? Yes. Yeah, so I, for me, I always want to rely and, um, you know, look at our, my own culture, right, on healing, right? So, um, so in the Pacific, you know, this is, so I'm referring to Samoan, I'm Samoan, so looking at our different wisdom, right? So there's different level of wisdom and then healing, right? So at the bottom, it says Tofalo Loto, it's this very deep understanding of ourselves, right? So in order for us to heal and change, you have to start with yourself, right? You you know what I mean? Um, and all of that, you need to understand ourselves, our biases, our bent, you know, our beliefs, our value, our worldview, our strength of our shortcoming and all of that, right? Um, you know, because it, it, it is, I feel like we all want to change the world, but we don't want to change ourselves, right? So in our culture, we're looking at the Tofalo Lotus, so that deep wisdom for us to understand that, right? And then in another level, then is Tofa Manino. It's, it's, it's this clarity. Manino is clear. So Tofa is wisdom, this, this wisdom that come out of clarity, right? And that talks about relationships, right? So not only yourself, but your relationship with other. So we do have this concept of Va. So Va is me and the next person. Va is that space between us. And that space we have to take, take with. So we have to cultivate that, right? We have to really cultivate that space because that's a space when it comes to healing, a lot of things need to happen before healing, right? Healing this space. There is forgiveness. There is yeah. grace. And also there is also appreciation of grace because a lot of people are receiving grace. They don't appreciate it, right? Because grace is something that is given to someone. So all of those kind of things. And I feel like um, in this va, we need to have, um, have respect for all the dimensions and complexity of relationships, right? So that is also part of our wisdom for us to look at, and not just individual va, but also va between organizations, right? Uh, yeah. So there's also an individual space between two individuals, but also space between different culture, right? Different organizations, right? Different ethnic groups, right? Because we're both a multi-ethnic group. So also like respecting all of, all of that. And then finally, like, you know, we also have a tofa ma mao, right? Which is that forward thinking that the, the wisdom for the future, right? Because in our culture, we're, we're just here, we're just here passing on our culture to the next generation, right? Mm -hmm. Having that. So whatever that we're doing right now, that's our legacy, right? I cannot go back and change what happened in the 1800s and in the 1940s and all of that, right? So there's a lot of healing on that, forgiveness, grace, and all of that kind of thing and figure out how to make it better. But where I am now is I am very, um, you know, committed to looking at what is our legacy because our future generation is going to look at us and that's what I'm accountable for, right? Accountability, it is part of, it is part of my culture. So yeah, that's it. And then, um, you Thank know, so you. we say goodbye in like Samoan, like whatever, we say the word tofa soifua and those are very two important words. So tofa, as you know, it means wisdom, but soifua is health. Right. So it's, it really is a blessing of wisdom and health. And this is from a group of people that I keep on here. Oh, they're sick because they don't value health. How can we not value health if our word of blessing when you say goodbye to someone is tofa soifua, which is the blessing mm. of wisdom and health. So thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you so much, Nia. I, I just love what you said. Like, you know, that Rachel healing has to start with an understanding and awareness of who we are. And then it just mushrooms from there. Understand who we are and our history. And then we improve our relationships with the other inter mm -hmm. interpersonal and then with community, and then leaving that legacy. That's so beautiful. So thank you so much. And I'm sure we have some questions that we want to circle back to um, for, but right now I'm going to ask um, Tony to rejoin me at the mic because Nia said something that really, really caught me. And she said, it's, it's about that, um, that 
that awareness, that self-awareness, and you kind of went on that self-awareness journey. And I want to talk about how your self-awareness journey has brought you to where you are today, Tony. You know, you you described yourself as once being complicit in racism. Tell us what you meant by that. Thank you, Erica. Thanks for thanks for being curious. You know, I mean, I, I think just creating a space like this to hear people's stories is itself healing. You know, it, it's been a good process for me already, just getting to know you and being a part of this. So, thank you, thank you for that. Um, yeah, and um, and and yeah, complicit in racism. Yeah, um, and it wasn't like I was once complicit in racism, and now I'm all good. I'm still complicit in, in racism, if I'm not actively doing something about it. So that's kind of how I mm. see it. That's where the Howard Zinn quote comes from. You can't be neutral on a moving train. That that train is moving, and, and particularly as a white person, I I uh, I needed to challenge myself to be actively anti-racist, or I am perpetuating a system that was by design racist from the very very beginning. So, mm-hmm. so that and I didn't come to this realization until you know after I was grown. But um, being complicit in racism, um, really overt racism. W- my personal experience came from when I moved uh, from a small town in Washington state called Sumner uh, to a other town of the Navajo Nation in New Mexico called Farmington. And it was 1975 and um, the American Indian movement had chosen to have their annual conference in Farmington to call attention to overt racist violence against native native people in Farmington. Um, and uh, that we moved there in July and in April, um, there was a rally organized by by Navajo people in downtown Farmington to call attention to the fact that um, two white high school students had beaten two native men to death um, in the foothills outside of Farmington. And there was very little being done in terms of like, you know, like law enforcement to really hold them accountable and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, so they organized this and a guy named Rodney Barker wrote a great book about it called, called The Broken Circle. So, so that's the context that I moved into Farmington in mm-hmm. when I was 11, uh, not knowing about that. Uh, and, in those details, and um, and it was ironic because I have a Native American brother. I have a I, I have a Native Indigenous brother named Mark, um, and my dad and mom. We moved to to that part of the country to serve Native people. My dad got a job at, um, at Shiprock on the Navajo Nation as a doctor, and so so it was a real kind of uh, I think you mentioned I forgot what word you used, Erica, but 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 the sort of like like double message, double double yeah, things yeah. going on at the same time, you know. I think part of being trying to become anti-racist is developing our our sort of our like muscle to hold both ideas in our mind at the same time, right? So it is it isn't like one or the other. Like my parents were good people, all that kind of stuff. And uh, how and, how did and, Mark and, come to be your brother? I'm curious about that. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, it was during a time called the Indian Indian Adoption Project, and it ran from 1958 to 1967. And it was a deliberate effort, effort by the U.S. government to adopt as many Native people into white homes as possible, because it was assumed they'd be better off. So, so they would oftentimes use justifications like, like general deprivation. And uh, and so Mark came into our home when my mom was pregnant with me, and it was at the height of the Indian Adoption Project. Um, and so that's the historical context under which Mark came into our home. And I didn't know about that context until I actually went to a conference and. It, it, and the workshop was about why was ICWA necessary? Why was the Indian Child Welfare Act necessary in 1978? And it was because of this Indian Adoption Project. So I recognized my own story in the in the workshop. I said, "Wow, they're they're, they're talking about my family. They're they're t- talking about Mark. That's when we got Mark." And it became a counter narrative. It became like another narrative to the narrative that was spun in my family as a as a kid growing up, which was this, this very romantic, you know, lovely, beautiful story about how my mom and dad <clears throat> went to get Mark, you know, went to like, just to go visit Mark. And he already had his bags packed and was already calling him mom and dad, you know? And so this, the, so go, growing up, you, th- you think, oh, wow, that's just a beautiful thing. It's like, it was like, you know, meant to be in this great connection. And, uh, and it was, I think, I think there was that kind of a connection. Um, I love Mark, Mark loves us. My parents loved Mark, obviously. Um, he loved them, and there's this other story. There's this other historical story that that white people, like like not only was Marx um, and other indigenous people's families um, harmed, but by, by this practice, right? Native people, other native people across the country, but many white, well-meaning folks were also used as instruments of cultural genocide. 
And so to hold both those ideas in our mind at the same time is very challenging, you know? Um, so that's how Mark came to our family. It's, it's a complicated question, how Mark came to our family. It's a complicated question. Yeah. yeah, you know, Nia talks about the complexity of what happens when this aspect of, of cultural genocide or colonialism happens. Mm -hmm. It is very, very complex. And you've had some healing that you told us that you've had to go through um, mm -hmm in order to get past that? Like, when did you begin to realize how critical it is to understand culture, understand the historical context of populations yeah. that have been oppressed, you know, as you begin to, to, uh, to heal from that and also with the work that you do, you know, when did you begin to realize, realize all of that? Well, I, it was when I saw Cornell West speak for the first time, Dr. Cornell West. I was at a family therapy conference. He was a keynote speaker. I was going through a really hard time in my personal life and I had this ticket to this conference. I went to the conference and Cornell West was a keynote speaker and he just blew me away. And what blew me away about this was the mid nineties. And he's the first person that really named uh, the vicious legacy of white supremacy. That's what he called it. Mm -hmm. The vicious legacy of white supremacy in this country and how it's shown up historically in our laws and our practices and in our hearts and minds. And he did it in a loving way. He did, he did it lovingly, you know? And I remember going up to him after the, after the, after his talk, and I just was like, you know, stunned. And then he's, you know, like he does, he made me feel like just by going up to him, I did something for him, you know? He, he said that, so, well, see now, Tony, you've done some, something for me now, you know? And, and, I, and I'll forget that. So I actually bought the VHS tape of the talk I just heard from, from Dr. West, and I watched it over and over and over again. I mean, I just, I couldn't get enough of it. I would show it to my family. I would show it to anybody who would watch it. And I would just start crying. I would just start crying when I would, when I would watch it. And, uh, and I almost memorized the whole thing probably. But it made me, made me realize that I think a lot of about, um, you know, why people come into terms with our own racism and our own complicity in racism is a grieving process, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's oftentimes denial, like, oh, no, I don't, I'm not racist. I'm, I'm clean. I'm pure, you know? To anger, like, like, what do you mean? You know, like getting defensive. There's that. Uh, there's the bargaining part. Oh no, I'm not. No, I've got, I've got a black friend. I got, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then there's uh, sadness, like, like deep sadness. And then, eventually, acceptance, and then hopefully action. You know, that, that comes mm -hmm. out of that. And so I think, speaking for myself, I go through in and out. I go in and out of those uh, phases of grief continually. So I'm, I'm very much a work in progress. You know, and I want to thank you for um, for actually, you know, just being really candid. You kind of like, you know, checking me on my anger a little bit when I was practicing this talk with you. You were saying, you know, you might want to, you know, like think about what, you know, you made me kind of think about that. Like, was that my anger coming out in an unproductive way? So I can still do that, obviously. So I'm very much a work in progress still. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you talk about um, Dr. West and how he did, how he said what he said in a loving way. And I think mm -hmm. that takes me right back to what Nia said about that grace that has to be offered and also received in order for healing to begin. And so you've taken what you've learned um, about culture and historical context, and now you've woven it into the work that you're doing now. So let's talk about that. I want to talk about your work um, with Families United for Education, yeah. as well as what you're doing now for the homeless population in Albuquerque. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Families United for Education, it's 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 a uh, Decentralized network of advocates in Albuquerque that I'm a part, that I'm blessed to be a part of. We're not a nonprofit. We don't have a hierarchy. We uh, come from all different races, institutions, ages, all that kind of thing. And it's not like we're huge, you know, but we're just very persistent. We're very, um, we um, stick with it. We don't go away. And so um, we started like in the, in the, from 2008, really challenging two community schools projects that had gone awry. Um, there was a change in leadership at the schools that we were working at. And uh, at one school, we were, we were working on bringing in anti-racism workshops to, this, to the school that was suffering racial violence um, every few years. And, and, and the school district was kind of ill-equipped to deal with it. And the other one, we were trying to turn a underused family center into a drop back in center for students who had been pushed out of the, of the high school. And uh, we planned for a year, brought in people, and then there was a change in administration and those Plans changed, and so we united those two uh, communities 
together and 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 went to the funding source, which were which were governmental entities, to to hold them accountable and, and say this isn't right. So that's kind of how we started. And back then we were called Advocates for Equity. Um, and then um, down the road a little bit, I became the point person for the school district because I worked for the school district too for 20 years. I became the point person to to help write a family engagement policy by engaging families and uh, hearing their stories. And a shout out to Michael Gaylor who uh, gave me that assignment. He, soon afterwards, he he resigned, but I was able to really run with that run with that project and just paid attention to who wasn't at the table, invited them to the table, um, heard their stories, recorded them, put it put it into an ethnographic research tool called Atlas TI, categorized the responses, gave it back to families to write, and ended up advocating for it. So we had this we we were going through the district's policy approval process, and we got to about step twelve. And our point person for the district from, from uh, Families United was an African American man who called me one day and said he needs to back back out of of the of the work. I'm like, well, why? And it, it, was, it was because of how he was being treated, um, mm. checking on the policy with the with the district. And so at that point, it was clear that like like, hey, we're we're not going to just go through the, the internal workings of the system to get this policy passed. We're going to go outside the system. And then we got stronger. So we started meeting more so in people's homes, in community centers, libraries, nonprofits, parks, wherever. And we started go going to school board meetings and I'm advocating for the policy to, to be passed as it was written. Um, and uh, letters to the editor, all that kind of thing. And uh, the policy finally passed in, in August of 2012 after about a lengthy organizing effort. And we're still going strong because we always said from the beginning that we won't stop until the experiences of our children change in the classroom. So our policy calls for utilizing the histories and cultures of our families as a foundation for education, not celebrating culture, utilizing the history in curriculum. And it calls for equitable and effective systems. And it calls for building relationships and capacity at schools, among teachers, students, community members, um, all that. And so we're still going strong. So the picture on the on the left there is Trevisa McKenzie at one of our anti-racism in education candidate forums. So every two years for the school board elections, we hold these anti-racism in education candidate forums. And we ask candidates for the school board, uh, why is there a gap in educational outcomes between white students and students of color? Why is that? And they oftentimes have a very difficult time answering that very basic question, right? And so at the end of the end of the uh, forums, we asked them, if elected, will you go through anti-racism training, yes or no? And they said yes, because we asked them publicly. And then we set up those trainings through a, through, through a local group called the Anti-Racism Training Institute of the Southwest, that Doran Jones is their director, um, and, who is, and they're our conduit to a national group called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. So we've actually got those workshops now into the APS budget after about 15 mm -hmm. years of, of organizing. So that picture on the right is Travis just last September, so 10 years difference, now Trevis is a teacher. He's actually doing lesson plans around racial justice, social justice, family engagement, families for education history, and the students and, and, and families created a families for education mural at Polk Hill School where Trevis now works. Now, That's beautiful. I think, now if Trevis were here, he would, he would want me to say, and now Polk Middle School is under threat of, of being closed without sufficient in, input from the community, you know? So the struggle continues, right? It's never yeah. over. Yeah. yeah, but so many things you said, oh my gosh, it was packed with like so many strategies that we promote. I mean, you probably don't even realize everything you said. You were talking about how you engage the community. You engage the media. Mm -hmm. You went out and engaged other nonprofits. You used uh, a, a strategy that we call engaging multiple multiple sectors so you did that you also had the parents front and center and making sure that you heard from them so you engaged those that were most impacted and yeah. then you took it from that and you created a policy a policy that now says you will not just celebrate people's history like oh we're going to celebrate this holiday no you're going to utilize those histories in education so celebrating and having a holiday is one thing it's great i'm not saying don't do it 
but it doesn't get you where you need to be. That's and right. having that policy that says you that you're going to utilize and you're going to take all of that into context is amazing. So congratulations on the work that you've done. I love the fact that you said you still have a lot of work to do. I think it's important for all of us to know that when we are involved in this type of work, if we're involved in advancing equity, we're involved in racial healing, you don't do one workshop and you're done, or you don't pass one policy and you're done. It is a cultural shift and cultural shifts take generations. So thank you so much for sharing that. Now, real quick, before we, um, before we go to Q&A, I want you to tell folks about what you're doing now. You are still continuing to fight for equity, but with a different group of people. Let's talk about that. Yeah, thanks, Erica. So I now work for a group called the New Mexico Coalition to End Homelessness. And it's a nonprofit group. Um, that is kind of like an, an intermediary between the federal government, HUD, the, uh, the you know Housing and Urban Development Department, and a lot of nonprofits that go after funding uh, to provide housing for people experiencing homelessness. So um, what we're working on now is, um, and I've been here just about a year now, almost a year, is we're trying to really center the voices of people with lived experience. So we've just started um, a lived experience group. And so they met this, this this afternoon, and my job is to is to bring them lunch and to provide them with a space, and and, and then answer questions if they have any questions. But they're, but but they're really running their own meeting, um, so to yeah. sort of respect their sense of agency and that they, and that they are the experts in this because because they've experienced it. And the other thing that we're doing is we're having um, you know anti-racism discussions. Uh, we had our first kind of group one, uh, a big group one last Friday only um around um you know what are what's your favorite anti-racist practice what's your favorite favorite racial equity practice and then also building relationships while we're doing that and and hoping the, hoping to roll out an anti-racism initiative in the coalition throughout new mexico around homelessness and and from my perspective if those two groups grow and then they merge then we'll really be cooking because because we shouldn't be doing stuff just on behalf of people. We need to be doing stuff with people, right? Yes. Um, otherwise, that, that just feeds into this sense of like, you know, distancing and saviorism and paternalism uh, that I need to watch out for, particularly as a white person, so. Oh man, I tell you, Tony, you and Nia have given me goosebumps. I've had to fight back a couple of tears. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much um, for, for sharing your wisdom. We're gonna go into Q and A in just a second, but, I'm going to ask um, James to to launch a poll because you heard so many cool strategies <laughs> about how to begin this process of racial healing, self awareness, engaging others. You know, Nia was talking about. Um, you know, it, it, not only just it, engaging your friends and stuff, but in, engaging community. You heard from Tony about passing policy, so. A, a number of strategies. I just want to know, do you think you could use them? Um, we're not going to share the, the results. This is actually just a, um, a poll that we're asking you to complete. We just want to see how we did. And um, James, I'm going to ask you to, to close the poll um, in five, four, three, two, one. So thank you um, so much for, for filling out that that poll for us. Um, now I'm gonna ask Joanna to come to the mic. I have a terrible cold, so I'm kind of like happy I'm gonna get like a big water break. Joanne, if you would just go ahead and start with those Q&A. <laughs> That'll give me a break, thanks. Thanks, Erica. Yep, take a quick break before heading over to the discussion group and wrapping this up. But we thank you, Dr. Nia and Tony, really got folks thinking. Um, about this important topic and maybe how we can all do better about um, really honoring historical context and racial healing. So lots of questions. And I will say, Tony, some folks had some very specific questions about your work with the school board. So um, we probably won't get to that level of detail during this time, but I encourage all of those folks to come to the discussion group because Tony will be there and we can get into um, some more details about both of their experiences. But I wanna, um, ask Dr. Nia to come back on because um, there are a couple questions for her. Dr. Nia, one of the things that really caught Adrian's attention was how you talked about um, the lingering impacts of 
of things that have been harmful to Native communities. One was you talked, and you talked about the fact that it takes generations and years and years for our environment to heal from some of what has been done. Do you have any sense, Adrian wonders, of how many generations would need to pass for the land and the ecosystem to be, to be considered healthy again or to heal as a result of some of the militarization that you spoke about? That is a very good question, right? And, you know, because I think that's that's the path that, that we are um, going through. So I just want to say this, on top of all those militarization, bombing, and all of those kind of thing, and the land is healing, but then we now have global warming also, right? So right. I feel like that's another layer, right? So, and I, it's just the, the, the whole impact of the global warming, like war, and then after war, it's the global warming. I mean, and I feel like it's we, we have to be active now. And I feel like if you really look at people in the forefront, you know, of that that whole movement, you see a lot of like of the Pacific Islander because they're the one that that needs, it's, it is going to take generations, right? Because we already see it now, you know, especially in health. If you take an example for how like somebody who's in diabetes education, very hard to let go of like that salty food, right? That taste for that, right? So if you look at the way that the the, the taste preference and all that. Um, and then also looking at all the species of taro, species of all these beautiful like, fruits and vegetables that was available, my ancestors that I don't have access to right now. And right now they're trying to bring it back using technology, right? Like some of the seeds and, and, and bring it back. So there is right. a movement to do that. But it's going to, I feel like my message is going to take a, a, a larger effort, right? It's going to take a group effort, right? It is going to take people's, you know, um, willingness to do it. But then also resources to do it, right? And then, um, and then it's a it's a collective effort, right? I yeah. think Pacific I think other people other than Pacific Islander to do it, right? Like everyone had to go in, and um, but this impact is global, also, right? So right. you know what's going to happen, you know, in the Pacific, it, people around the world is going to feel this impact, right? So I found that awareness that we're not just isolating the ocean. Whatever happened in that ocean, you know, it's going to impact all of us here That's too, right? right? The climate and you know all of that. And you raise an important point that it's not just trying to heal from what was done in the past, but mitigating what we're contributing still today, yeah, to the land and the environment. Thank you. All right, Tony, you're up for a question. And there's just, like I said, lots of questions about the incredible work you're doing with um, the schools and the board. When Monica had a question and wondered, have you been able to measure or collect the impact of your work on the families within the school district? Hmm. Good question. Uh, that's a good question. Now, I, I wouldn't say measure quantitatively, but the but the qualitative measurement is certainly there through people's stories. You know, so we we just collected a lot of stories um, at the outset of our work, and we continue to do storytelling as like part of our work. Um, but we're really not focused on like data collection so much. Um, we're uh, we're like not a nonprofit. We're not a uh, organization or anything like that. We're we're a, a network. We're a we're a network that's built on relationships, and it, and it feels um, strong and mighty sometimes, and sometimes it feels kind of vulnerable, you know. Um, but originally, we had about 500 families involved in the policy development process, and we've been going now for you know uh, 12, uh, 12, 14, 12, 13 years now, and so that's the that's grown from there. Um, and some people have like dropped off and like one of the, um, um, Hein Wynn, one of our founding members, likes to say we're, we're, uh, we're all on a boat, a rowboat rowing upstream mm -hmm. and people can get off the boat or get on the boat at any time. Um, but if you're on the boat, we have to row together. And so that's kind of how, how it is. Like, like people will step back and then they'll come back and all the while kind of paying attention to just, to who's not at the table and inviting them to the table. And by who's not at the table, I mean around like race, gender, sexual orientation, age, all that, right? Because um, we have holes, we have, we have as, a, as a white, you know, heterosexual middle-class man, I certainly have blind spots. And so I, I, we all need to be like paying attention to who's not at the table and uh, addressing things too in the group, which is also something that, and this, is, this isn't like a measurement, but, but, um, you know, when all the isms come up, when the isms come up, 
in our group, like, you know, racism, sexism, homophobia, those kind of things. Are we, are we addressing those, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and that's a measurement. And, you know, I can't say that we're doing great at that. I mean, I think we, we have addressed it when it's come up real overtly, but what we're looking at now is to do um, another kind of uh, dedicate some time to intersectionality um, and like how that's showing up. So we, so um, it's an ongoing, ongoing process, but, but we haven't really worked on data. Because other than and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, we do do power mapping. So we actually map out like the power of, of the school board. Like we have like our agenda, which is anti-racism, ethnic studies, mm -hmm. family engagement. And then we have the opposing agenda, which is like standardized testing, you know, status quo, um, uh -huh. you know, all that kind of stuff. And we've actually measured through time how we've been able to shift power towards our agenda on the school board and not just um, on the school board, but, but with like elected officials too who have become, who have become our allies and friends, some of whom mm -hmm. were a part of the network before they became elected officials and now they're elected officials. And we've also tracked our own power has increased. Great. So, um, so, so we track data in that way. Good, thank you. Fair enough. Um, I think we only have a few more minutes for questions and folks, like I said, I knew we weren't going to get to some of the details or Eric, are you going to cut us off now? No, you okay. get like you get like 60 seconds. So Jenna, just so you, Dr. Nia and Tony, you've got 60 seconds, 30 seconds each. If you could give one tip about how do we get people, particularly for Dr. Nia, people who um, maybe think, well, I don't work with native um you know, Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian populations. Um, Tony, I don't work with Native American populations. What's my role in this? Like, why do I, what can, why do I need to do something? And what is it the first thing to do to take action? I think, you know, I think the first, if you don't work with it, just develop relationship with Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, because we're everywhere, you know, we, you know, we're in all 50 states, you know, I think, and many times they don't even know who we are, right? They think we're Hispanics or other ethnic group, right? So I think for everyone is to make friends, right? Develop those relationship, right? Um, I always tell my students that why, you know, whatever else is get invited to a Samoan funeral or a way, right? Because in, in those cultural stuff like that, you know, go and, and participate and then learn more. I feel like it's developing friendship um, and then developing relationship with Pacifica people. And then if you're in, in that area, learn more about it. Read a book, you know, about Pacific people, right? Their journey and all of that, because I feel like that's another way for, for everyone to get to know who we are. Great advice. Uncover them, find them because they're there. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, jump in real quick. Yeah, I would just say, um, just pay attention to who's not at the table and invite them to the table. Um, and then when you organize meetings and stuff, you know, organize them in spaces, um, utilize community spaces, utilize, you know, you know, different spaces. And I love what, what Nia, Nia said about VA, the, the like space between us. I mean, that, that's such a powerful thing. How are we taking care of, of, of those spaces between us? Um, you know, and how might our own internalized stuff be in, inhibiting or um, doing damage in, 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 inadvertently to sort of reflect, so be critical lovers of ourselves. And the last thing that I would say would be like, don't get discouraged if you organize a meeting and very few people come. Uh, I, I have to work through those feelings of like, kind of being like, you know, let down sometimes, but then I need to focus on like, who is there, right? Who did come and then, and then build on that. So that's what I would end with. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna give it back to Erica, but folks, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions, but please join us for the discussion group and we will prioritize the questions that came in during the webinar to kick us off there. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, Joanne. And I love how Nia and um, Tony's responses all came back to relationships. That is so core. So thank you so much um, for those great questions too, by the way. So um, Joanne's heading over to the discussion groups, but um, Colleen is actually chatting out a link to our feedback survey, if she hasn't already. Um, please share your thoughts about today's webinar because um, we do take your feedback um, into account and we look at it closely and we look at it to improve our webinar. So please do complete that. You don't have to do it right now, but just click on the link and fill it out later. You know, Dr. George Benjamin, he's the executive producer, director of American Public Health Association, and he contends that health is political, whether we like it or not, it's political. So in this webinar next 
next month, we're going to explore nonpartisan opportunities to promote health and equity to policymakers. So we're going to hear from Hunter Sox, who is in South Carolina. He's going to introduce us to a health policy program, fellows program for elected officials. And we're going to hear from Katie Michael with Change Lab Solutions. Some of you may have heard about that awesome organization. So they're going to talk to us about health policy next week and how do we get equitable health policy passed. You don't want to miss that webinar. You can go ahead and register for that webinar right now on our website. And, you know, before we go to our discussion group, I want you to know it's now easier than ever to search for data and resources for your community health improvement work. Our colleagues at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps have spent the last two years reworking our county snapshots just for you so that they are more accessible and easier to use. So be sure to check out your county snapshot today so you can see what those new changes look like. And again, that discussion group is getting ready to start right now. So Colleen's chatting out a link to that. I will see you there momentarily. And be sure to stay in touch with us through social media or subscribing to our newsletter. newsletter. We, um, that's the best way to learn about our um, resources and our upcoming webinars. And I wanna thank Dr. Ayatoto and Tony Watkins for sharing their personal stories and their wisdom with us today. And so I hope to see you all in the discussion group and, and to all of you out there, thank you for everything that you do to advance equity in your own communities. And I will see you next month.